Good evening, everyone. I'm Vince Stango, Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer here at the National Constitution Center, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you here to tonight's program. Before we welcome our guests tonight to the stage, I'd like to take a minute to share some information about our upcoming programs. This season, we will host a number of exciting speakers and engaging constitutional conversations, including on February 5th, a sweeping historical discussion on how the right to bear arms has been interpreted from America's founding to today. On February 7th, a retrospective commemorating the constitutional legacy of the late Justice Antonin Scalia two years after his death. On February 21st, a special members program on the role of dissent throughout American history. On March 20th, an exclusive book launch with National Constitution Center President and CEO Jeffrey Rosen on William Howard Taft, and of course, much more. To purchase tickets or for more details about these and other upcoming events, please visit constitutioncenter.org forward slash debate. And if you're interested in becoming a member of the National Constitution Center, please visit the membership table directly outside the auditorium lobby for more information on how to join today. Members receive free tickets to our popular daytime programs, discounted tickets, to evening events like tonight, all while directly supporting the center's nonprofit, nonpartisan mission to bring people together of all ages and perspectives to learn about, debate, and celebrate the U.S. Constitution. And now it is my pleasure to introduce two great friends of the National Constitution Center. Michael Nutter was elected mayor of Philadelphia in 2007 and served two terms. Esquire magazine named him in 2011 to its Americans of the Year list and he was named a public official of the year by Governing Magazine in 2014. He is an executive fellow at the University of Pennsylvania's School of Social Policy and Practice and is a professor of professional practice in urban and public affairs at Columbia University. He joins us, he joins us today to discuss his latest book, Mayor, The Best Job in Politics, which he will sign copies of following the discussion. We are also pleased to welcome tonight's moderator, Michael Smirkanish. Michael is the host of the Michael Smirkanish program on Sirius XM, the host of CNN's Smirkanish, a newspaper columnist, and an author. He has been an MSNBC contributor and frequent guest host of Hardball for Chris Matthews, and prior to turning to broadcasting as a full-time endeavor, he practiced law for 10 years with James E. Beasley, who is the namesake of the Beasley School of Law at Temple University. Please join me in welcoming Michael Smirkanish and Michael Nutter. Thanks very much. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Mayor, good evening. Good evening, Michael. Mayor. The best job in politics. Why is it the best job in politics? Because uh, you can get stuff done. Uh, you can see the value uh, and the impact of your work. You can help to change people's lives. Uh, and it's a whole lot of fun. Is it fair to say that if you had been able to master the periodic table when you were at Penn, you would never have pursued a career in politics? Tell the story. It is. It's pretty likely, but um, there came a point where I just really didn't give a damn. <laughs> table of elements. Now I went to uh, I went and um, pre-med. It's a biomedical engineering major, admitted to the engineering school, and uh, it became very clear uh, in much an auditorium like this, only bigger, that by mid-semester you could pretty much sit wherever you wanted, and I think after. Pretty much failing the first three exams, it was clear uh, that A, I was not passing this course, B, I really didn't give a damn about the table of elements, and C, you're not going to be a doctor. You, you had to first work semester. to get to Wharton. Yeah. How were you able to achieve that? Well, this is being recorded, so um, <laughs> I want to respect the University of Pennsylvania. Um, it, was a, it was a long, torturous you know, kind of path. Um, about 95% of that torture created by myself, uh, by uh, 
not necessarily being the most studious uh, person. Lloyd Shore will kill me for saying that. Um, no, I, was, uh, I started working at the Impulse uh, nightclub, and I was probably working about 60 hours a week and studying uh, maybe about 60 minutes. Um, and um, so I tried to leave engineering school because, again, it was clear that there was no future there for me. So right after my first semester, I tried to transfer. Uh, they, uh, Morton denied my application because I had not kept a full course load which at the time was four courses. The engineering school then found out that I tried to transfer and said, if you do that again and you're not successful, we're gonna kick you out of school. Okay. Um, so then I said, okay, but I wanna to go to Wharton and I wanna keep taking a course of study for uh, entrepreneurial management. So then I switched to the uh, Faculty of Arts and Sciences, uh, the um, FAC, and, but never declared a major but I kept taking Wharton courses. So then they sent me a letter saying, A, you're not a Wharton student. B, uh, you have a pretty low average. And C, if you don't get yourself together, we're gonna kick you out of school. <laughs> um, so I finally got a little more serious about my work. Um, I did take a number of courses uh, multiple times because I really enjoyed them. Um, <laughs> and uh, so in May of 1979, I was six courses short of graduating. Um, for some bizarre reason, they actually let me walk in graduation. My mom was thrilled and my grandmother. I said, I don't know what you're so excited about. I have to go to summer school tomorrow. Um, <laughs> but um, probably maybe cut kind of my first political deal. I had an agreement with the, uh, with the dean of undergraduate uh, Wharton. And he said, look, you have six courses. I said, I'm not coming back in September. This is it. And he said, if you achieve you know, a certain average for these six courses, you'll be good to go. Um, I hit the number right on the number. Um, and uh, he said, well, Mr. Nader, you're in and you're out. Goodbye. It's, <laughs> nice. it's been nice knowing you. <laughs> you mentioned a moment ago the impulse disc attack. And you write about this in the book. Did Mayor Mike learn anything from Mixmaster Mike? Any lessons in that disco that applied to your governance? Well, you know, it was possibly some of the best training, and I'll tell you why. So at the club, um, I met a lot of people. I shook a lot of hands. I had to remember a lot of people. And every now and then, you know, we might have to throw someone out. Um, you know, I'm not like the biggest guy around. So I learned some negotiating skills, some people skills, of how to nicely put somebody out of a nightclub. Uh, and um, as mayor, you know, I met a lot of people. <laughs> I shook a lot of hands, <laughs> had to remember a lot of folks, and every now and then I had to put some people out of places. So, <laughs> yeah. I want to talk about some of the, the political battles that you've waged over the years. Let's begin with Mrs. Levinsky, 282 votes to Michael Nutter's 48. Who was she and what yeah. happened? So, uh, Lillian Levinsky was a committee person uh, in the 52nd Ward. I, just gotten involved with uh, Councilman John Anderson. He was seeking to become ward leader in 1982. And I lived in a division where they were looking for a committee person. And so I went down to voter registration. You know, I, I'm, I mean, I was a Wharton School graduate. So, I mean, I was about data and information and regression analysis. And I mean, I was going to figure this thing out. And um, I went down to voter registration. And I started looking, because I wanted to understand the constituency. There were three apartment buildings. I lived in like the really cool building, and the other two had more senior um, uh, residents. Like 1898, date of birth, <laughs> 1901, 1905. So I realized this is a very old constituency here. And I was in my early 20s, and so, and it was apartment buildings. Uh, and so there were days where I would literally wait until someone came out of the building and then suddenly I realized, oh, maybe I can go in this way to put stuff under people's doors, which you were not supposed to do in the first place. But Lillian knew everybody. I virtually knew no one. She kicked my butt. Um, at the time, uh, committee people ran every two years. Now they run every four years. And so I ran again, um, got a little closer 
But it was clear that it would probably take about 20, 25 years to ever <laughs> be Lillian. I mean, she may have passed away. Um, and so another big political decision, I moved. <laughs> It's funny it, how you never forget the lessons from that first campaign. When, when, I was, when I was at Penn Law, I ran for the state legislature in Bucks County. I lost by 419 votes. You're and as I'd like to say, I've, I've since located 236 of those people. <laughs> so you get elected to city council. And one of your first initiatives, sort of ahead of your time as we live in this era of Black Lives Matter, was the formation of the Police Advisory Commission. How come? There have been a series of events um, prior to my time in city council. I had legitimately done a bunch of research. Actually, um, Councilman Anderson had looked at this issue uh, when he was in city council um, in, um, in his term. And uh, it just seemed that uh, at the time, at least, once a complaint went in, it pretty much went nowhere. Uh, folks had lost confidence in, at times, the credibility of some of the investigations. Other cities had similar civilian-related bodies, New York in particular, so did a ton of research uh, all around the country on this issue, uh, put it forward. It was controversial. Um, the mayor at the time, Mayor Rendell, had been the former district attorney, uh, really hated it, uh, like a lot. Um, that was like September of 1992 when I introduced that piece of legislation. I was eight, seven, eight months into the job as freshman councilman creating all this controversy. Um, President Street at the time, very supportive. Um, a lot of battles back and forth. Uh, we passed that bill uh, 11 to 6. The mayor vetoed it. Uh, but to Credit Ed Rendell, uh, and I think he knows that I know this. Um, through a lot of behind the scenes conversations, it became clear that the mayor wanted to end the controversy. And in a pretty dramatic fashion, uh, then Councilman uh, Thatcher Longstreth uh, changed his vote on the override, and the bill passed 12 to 5. I'm not giving away the whole book for free. We want people to, well, they get the book tonight, but I, we want people to buy the book who I, watch it on like C SPAN. We would like people to buy the book. Right. But, but a number of the stories, I, I, I do want to pull from it. You express regret in the book for your position initially on the domestic partnership bill. Talk about dealing with that issue in this book. Um, so I don't think it was uh, very well known at the time, um, but Councilman Anderson was gay. Um, this was not the... Um, totally loving, open, progressive uh, city that we are today, socially at least, uh, in uh, the late 70s, early 80s. Uh, but I saw and experienced in a, in a pretty personal way uh, the impact that uh, his status, I guess if you will, uh, had politically. Uh, from time to time threats of people trying to out him, um, other comments that were made uh, from time to time. And uh, so I developed you know, uh, uh, a great sensitivity uh, to some of the challenges of folks in the LGBTQ uh, uh, community. Um, the politics got complicated because I was pushing the uh, Police Advisory Commission. At the same time, uh, Councilman Ortiz uh, was pushing for domestic partnership benefits. Council President Street uh, was very much in favor of the Police Advisory Commission and very much against domestic partnership. And I got caught in, I think, a kind of a freshman rookie mistake of not being able to separate uh, those two things in the way that I should have based on my own uh, perspective uh, and, um, and, and feelings. Um, I didn't do anything uh, to undermine uh, Councilman Ortiz, but I felt personally I was not as supportive uh, publicly as I should have been because I didn't want to jam myself up uh, on the um, Police Advisory Commission piece. It ended up not going anywhere at that time, but I made a commitment to myself in that moment uh, that this issue was going to get resolved and I was going to be the person to do it. The Police Advisory Commission, one example of where Councilman Michael Nutter was ahead of his time. As I look back at your record and focus on the year 2000, the smoking ban, which was really the, the first initiative 
on this scale and scope was a pretty significant achievement for a still young councilman. Yeah, um, and uh, as um, later uh, in my career, uh, a lot of credit uh, goes to uh, goes to our daughter. I know Lisa is right there. Um, Lisa was working at a at a firm and did a lot of consulting and travel, and rather than completely torture uh, Olivia uh, with uh, my cooking, uh, I decided to take her to dinner. Um, I actually passed that, passed that restaurant just the other day, and we're sitting there, and um, you know, I always got like some paper and crayons and drawing and all that kind of stuff. She loved doing that. But she observed that there was a man smoking in the restaurant and said, you know, that man is smoking. And, you know, does he know that's bad for him? And I said, yeah, well, you know, I mean, that's what... I mean, some people do that. She went back to drawing. And then she said, well, aren't you on city council? What are you going to do about that? She was five years old. Not a whole lot you can say, <laughs> you know, to that. Um, yes, I am on city council, and I guess I need to do something about it. So we started that journey. Uh, it took six years to get that piece of legislation passed, and it was actually one of the last bills uh, that I voted on uh, before resigning city council to run for mayor. Police Advisory Commission, smoking ban, campaign finance reform, mm -hmm. another feather in your cap? Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, did a lot of work in that area, but I always uh, make it a point. The first uh, campaign finance law was actually passed by uh, Councilman Wilson Good Jr. Uh, right after the 2003 election. And I think we all remember a lot of things from the 2003 election. Um, you know, the, the bug and all of that. Um, but it was also clear that there were uh, concerns uh, about campaign finance, about pay to play, about, you know, how the government was functioning and operating. So I think late November, early December of 2003, the first piece of legis legislation came through. Uh, the mayor at the time, uh, Mayor Street, was opposed to it. The council passed it anyway. Um, and then I subsequently. I did another piece um, with different restrictions, new contracting uh, legislation. If you did business with the city, you could only give a certain amount, attribution rules, a whole host of things. Um, and then subsequently the uh, ethics board. Um, I read uh, every indictment uh, that came subsequent to the 2003 election. Uh, we made numerous amendments based on updated indictments uh, that the federal government uh, was coming forward that was in the case of Ron White and uh, Corey Kemp. Um, and I think it was one of those moments where only in that kind of crisis could we have ever gotten that kind of legislation passed. I mean, people are not excited about this. Uh, we are the only place in the state that would have uh, campaign finance limits, uh, which subsequent subsequently uh, were litigated all the way up to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, and we were successful. As you look back now at the bug, what does Michael Nutter think of the successful effort to cast that as John Ashcroft and the Republicans from Washington trying to dictate the outcome of a Philadelphia mayoral race? Well, I mean, I think we now know that, I mean, that story was a complete fabrication and total bullshit. So. Um, but, I mean, it, at, in the moment, worked. it worked. Um, but, I mean, many of us knew that there was no way in the world uh, that that was really what was going on. Uh, but, you know, it's a heavily Democratic city. Folks did not like George Bush, certainly didn't like John Ashcroft. So, I mean, it, they, there was a narrative that was ready-made. I mean, after they kind of, about two or three days uh, after, uh, after that, big explosive story, um, everyone was kind of radio silent, we couldn't figure out what was going on, and then they laid out, you know, that scenario, and people bought it. You point out in the book, I think a lot of folks forget that the margin in that cycle, which was Cats and Street 2, yeah. was bigger than it was four years prior. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I don't know if he's here, he's the guru of numbers, uh, but I mean, Neil will know this well, I think the 99 Street Cats race, I think the margin was somewhere in the 9400 neighborhood, one of the closest in modern history. And I think the rematch, I think 
uh, Mayor Street won by like 85,000. I mean, it was some absurd number based on, you know, this whole fiction uh, that had been created about um, the Republicans in Washington were trying to take down uh, the black Democratic mayor of Philadelphia, which would then lead to the Republicans being able to win Pennsylvania in 2004. That was the fundamental theory. theory. Yeah. yeah, which I mean, just made no sense whatsoever. Summer of 2006, you resigned from council. You have your eye now set on the mayorality. I, I was surprised, maybe I knew at the time, I'd forgotten what a, a shoestring operation it was at the outset of your campaign. Describe it. Um, I'm not, uh, I'm, we may have borrowed some shoestrings. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, um, <laughs> so in May of 2006, uh, we take a poll. I'm still in city council. And I mean, it was a well-known firm, Garen Hart Yang, Fred Yang, um, nationally recognized pollster, paid good money. Um, and the poll said that basically, no matter who runs, you can't win. Well, how much did we pay for that? Uh, you know. <laughs> um, but back and forth, back and forth. And, you know, at the end, it's like, what are we going to do? And I said to Fred, well, what do you think? And he said, well, difficult, not impossible. Okay. Um, but I think at this point, and, and uh, I mean, we just kind of jump right into things. You know, you don't just decide, well, you shouldn't. Uh, you don't just decide you're going to quit your job and run for mayor of, I don't know, small, medium, or large city uh, without a whole lot of conversation with a lot of folks. Uh, and the first one really has to be at home. Um, you know, having uh, support, I mean, more than support, but having real support uh, from uh, Lisa and Olivia uh, just, I mean, you can't do it. Um, so we had a lot of conversation about that. Um, there was one a discussion, I mean, when the final kind of decision was being made, uh, and Olivia said, well, Dad, you know, if this is what you really want to do, then, you know, that's what you should do, and, and we'll support you. And about five minutes later, she said, um, well, by the way, so you have to quit your job in city council? And I said, yes, quiet. She said, well, so do I need to get a job? <laughs> There, there's no interest like self-interest. Um, <laughs> so, so they're all in. Um, you know, we're starting to assemble this team, and we get this office um, at uh, 123 South Broad Street. Um, it's about 500 square feet. Um, Aaron Santamore is down there. Um, and then this redhead guy comes in the office one day, um, and I said, well, who is that? Um, and that was Luke Butler, um, who, uh, you know, it's, I mean, maybe it's dissipated a little bit over time, but, I mean, it was pretty clear that I mean, he was not from West Philly, um, you know, with a little British accent. And uh, so he'd come here to go to school and somehow found his way to me. He'd been involved in politics over in the, over in the U.K., and so, you know, we're sitting in our little 500-square-foot office. We've got plenty of space, a lot of desks and all that. And, I mean, suddenly, like, people are coming to volunteer. And we had to move uh, to uh, 42 South 15th. And then the operation became much bigger. And, and of course... But no one thought that we could win. And, of course, you had uh, a secret surprise on your side. I have a video screen here for a reason. Oh, I didn't notice that. I, I hope it works. And yeah. if it does, roll it. <laughs> My name is Olivia Nutter. This is my dad. This is a house my dad grew up in in West Philadelphia. This is our dog. This is my favorite food. My dad's pretty cool for an old guy. This is where I go to middle school. My dad's the only Democrat for mayor with a child in the public schools. I know he wants to make them better and safer. My dad's pretty busy these days, but he still finds time to take me to school. Have a good day. Yep. Be good.
you know, like, like you, I've paid attention for a long time. I, I don't think there's ever been, and I shouldn't limit it to Philadelphia, but I don't remember any commercial with the impact of that in a mayoral race. Talk about it. Um, well, um, I mean, this is, that's all uh, the campaign group. Uh, in their work, uh, Neil Oxman and J.J. Balaban, we, um, I, just, I, I had this one thought that, I mean, I started, which is not my forte at all, um, but I had this thought, I mean, we need to design a, just a, a handout, a piece of literature, something with, you know, family or some quotes or something. I started playing around with that and sent it over to the team and they reminded me, um, you know, especially, you know, Neil and his, he's a very quiet, um, <laughs> Um, unassuming, you know, kind of uh, kind of person. You almost have to ask him to speak up sometimes. Um, and I'm here, Michael. <laughs> there he is. Only, I, 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 Neil Oxman I, I, is I, in the back row. I was row. trying to wait to see how long it was going to take. <laughs> um, and he reminded me in his in his unique way that this is not what I do. Um, but you know, took it from me anyway. And uh, they came back and said, no, we think we can turn this into something else. Um, you have a family, you have these, I mean, I mean everything is true. Um, I did take her to school every day. Um, it may have been the last time that room looked like that. Um, <laughs> I really do have a wife, we had a dog, that was our house, um, I owned a car. Um, and they just came back and, and here it is. And you know, we ran, he's in the back, um, I think we ran 10 other ads, or shot 10 others, and most of them played. Um, that is pretty much the only one that anyone remembers. Um, I think it ran for maybe a week, 10 days, um, and came back at the end for, for a different purpose. Um, it told a story and defined me or redefined me from not some, you know, the nerdy Wharton guy, the policy wonk from city council, the hard charging, maybe never smiles enough, uh, all of that, to he has a family, he grew up in a row house, his daughter goes to public school, he really cares, and he takes her to school every day. And it meant a lot of different things to a lot of different people, depending on who they were, black, white, Latino, Asian, um, young, older. Um, it, uh, it, it did change the dynamics of the race. Before I move on from the commercial, and, and not just because she's here, give us all the Olivia update. Well, um, she's, so for a lot of folks, so she's not 12 anymore. <laughs> um, people keep asking me, did she graduate from high school yet? And you know, No. Uh, Olivia graduated in May uh, from uh, Columbia University. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, through, uh, through the help of uh, some good friends in, in politics, uh, she is now a staff assistant on the uh, Senate uh, Small Business and Entrepreneurship Committee on the Democratic side in Washington. So, awesome. So she, thanks, yeah. Congrats. I, the, Mayor, it's, it's the like... The only nutter in public service. <laughs> it's like uh, running my radio show. I have to be mindful of the yeah, clock. the clock. Because I, I could keep you all night, and yeah. at a certain point, I'm, I'm going to surrender to questions that have come from the audience. Sure. This is a lightning round. Got it. Seven questions, bang, 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 bang. Actually, yep. not even questions, just thoughts, and I want to hear what you have to say about them, and then I'm going to move into your mayorality. Mm -hmm. Number one, Bob Brady announced today he's not seeking re-election. You know, um, <laughs> you know, we're not supposed to die in these jobs. Um, and, you know, it's, I think there's a whole generational shift going on in the city and across the country. It's just time for a whole bunch of new people to run for office. The Rizzo statue belongs? Somewhere else. Uh, I'd be derelict if I didn't put this on the list. Eagles Pats. E A G L E S Eagles. 
I listened as we all listened to your introduction. You got a lot. Of, I thought I had a lot of things going on here. <laughs> balls juggling in the air. You got a lot yeah. of careers. Yeah. Favorite post mayoral gig is what? The opportunity to have a relationship at both the uh, University of Pennsylvania and Columbia University. Uh, I'm really enjoying um, teaching and the level of engagement uh, with students and faculty. Um, and for me, I mean, it's been the best kind of transition. Um, you know, running the city is a big bureaucratic place with a lot of rules and regulations. College and university, big bureaucratic place with a lot of rules and regulations. The difference, I'm not in charge. <laughs> Last night, Donald Trump, first State of the Union. Disaster. The speech or the State of the Union? Speech. Yeah, I mean, you know, look, um, I mean, he is, I mean, this would be my most partisan comment. I mean, there's something materially wrong with him. Um, the country has been through worse. Um, and if folks get off their butt and go out and vote in 2018, we'll make a difference in Congress uh, and then change the presidency in 2020. Two, two more of the quick ones. Mayor Jim Kenney. Doing a job. Um, you know, I, I mean, I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge at least, and I, as I was supposedly sneaking in the side, I saw Don Schwartz. Um, I mean, it was Don Schwartz's idea uh, that we propose a, a sugar sweetened beverage tax uh, in the city of Philadelphia. Uh, and uh, I think it's that level of, again, innovation and foresight. Uh, that has now led to, let's put litigation aside, uh, you know, the success uh, in uh, 2016. Um, focus on universal pre-K, uh, you know, again, another issue that, I mean, all of us care deeply about during, during my tenure. And so, I mean, there are a lot of things going on in the city of Philadelphia that, I mean, we tried to, you know, like the Athenian Oath, we tried to leave the city in uh, better shape than, than we found it. And I think uh, the mayor is, you know, capitalizing on those things, and then he has his own initiatives. Fine, final lightning round question. Michael Nutter in 10 years. Well, first, I'd like to be here. Um, <laughs> and I'll be 70. Uh, so, um, yeah, I'll be doing many of the same things uh, that I'm doing now, trying to work with candidates uh, across the country. Uh, to change the political landscape, uh, stay involved in politics, stay involved with, uh, with teaching. Probably by that point, might slow down uh, just a little bit. But, you know, I'm, I believe in being active. Are I'll you, be around. Are you done running for office yourself? Yes. Um, and part of it is why that's the title of the book. There's no other office uh, that I'm really interested in. Um, there's no other office that you can have the impact the kinds of things and the people that I talked about. I mean, I could name our folks all night long, but I mean, there are certain things that we're very, very proud of. We saved people's lives from a public safety standpoint. There are more kids uh, who graduated from high school and went on to college and graduated from there, more people working. Uh, you look at the number of cranes in the sky and buildings still going up. I broke ground on a bunch of those buildings uh, when, when I was in office. And I think we did improve uh, the ethical uh, a culture uh, of the city of Philadelphia. There aren't many jobs in politics uh, that you can have that kind of impact, and that's part of what I loved. And the family that I got to work with, some fantastic public servants. Is one of the attractions and, and the reason that it's the best job in politics that you are free of some of the ideological entanglements that, say, a member of the House or the Senate would face? You quote the very famous Fiorello LaGuardia. Yeah. Tell everybody what that is, and, and talk to yeah. me about, I mean, is it just making the trains run on time, or does ideology kick in? Um, I wouldn't call it ideology, and maybe it's splitting hairs, just about a, a, a governing philosophy. Um, you know, I was just at the U.S. Conference of Mayors last week. I mean, you don't hear conversation about a Democratic uh, position or a Republican position on infrastructure, on public safety on whether kids are getting an education, clean water, sustainability, all of these issues. I mean, you have as many Republican mayors who like the community development block grant program as Democratic mayors. So, I mean, you just don't have time for a lot of nonsense. Um, and, I mean, the parties take positions and all that. 
you got to make sure there's water running through the pipes, that a professional shows up at a 911 call. When tragedy strikes, everybody really kind of really does come together. Uh, and that's what governing is about at the local level. Uh, you don't have much time for philosophical debates. If there's 15 inches of snow outside, with, and I know that C-SPAN is here and I love them, but I mean, you know, I can't go make a speech on C-SPAN uh, and think that something's going to result from that. But people do that at 3 o'clock in the morning back home to the constituents. Mayors can't do that. You either moved the snow or you didn't. You either picked up my trash or you didn't. The place is either running well or it's not. That's this job. Day one, you is called a, a crime emergency. You mm -hmm. were benefited by a, a then new, relatively new police commissioner in, in Chuck Ramsey. But that was a priority of yours from day one until the end. Well, I mean, again, a little bit of backstory. Um, in the early 2000s, um, you know, New York and a bunch of other places, and New York has been on this, you know, incredible uh, downward trend in terms of their uh, homicides, but a bunch of other big cities across the country, their numbers were going down, ours were still going up. I thought we could do something about it uh, and made it a centerpiece of the campaign. As, you know, Mayor Mike Bloomberg says, you know, you can't have a great city if people don't feel safe. And that was a growing concern. There was a, there was a daily counter on the front page of one of the newspapers about the level of homicides in the city. So I took that on as a major issue. Uh, we fought some battles about it. But, you know, the facts are the facts. First year, 15% reduction in homicides, 31% over, uh, over the eight-year period. In the spring of 2008, you experienced the sort of emotional highs and emotional <laughs> lows within a, a, a very uh, close time period. We'll deal yeah. with the highs first. Yeah. March 31, 2008, you get to throw out the first pitch at the Phillies. How much preparation went into it? Uh, a fair amount. Um, I, I think, um, you know, I, I think you can pretty much destroy your career uh, with a bad pitch in front of 45,000 people <laughs> on, uh, on opening day in Philadelphia. Um, you know, we make a sport of torturing elected officials at, at uh, sporting events. Fortunately, it was three months in. I really hadn't done anything to anybody, so people didn't have much reason to be upset with me. Um, we, um, it was with, uh, mostly with Jordan Schwartz, um, probably about two weeks of practice and a couple of visits down to the ballpark. For that one throw? For one throw. <laughs> but it paid off for you. Well, I threw a strike, so, you know. <laughs> Unfortunately, a very yeah. sad note. May 3rd, 2008, Sergeant Lisbinski. Yeah. Uh, you say in the book, nothing, absolutely nothing prepares you for that moment. Well, that's true. Um, you know, I was, I was in City Hall, I was between events. We got a call that an officer had been shot. Uh, we had no details, uh, but the word was just, you know, kind of stay put. Probably about 10 minutes later, another call, you need to get to the hospital. Um, I mean, you know, we have 6,000 plus police officers. It's impossible to know them all. And I, again, I've only been mayor for, for a little while. Um, but nonetheless, uh, welcoming the, the family as people are running in, the officers, it was a very chaotic scene. And you know the other parts of that, three people in a botched robbery, uh, one dead, one in custody, one in the wind. Um, uh, he was hit with an AK-47 uh, that nearly took his arm off his shoulder. Um, to experience those family members and to be in the room uh, when the doctor comes in and says that the sergeant didn't make it, I mean, there's nothing you can say, there's nothing you can do. But you have to, because it is your obligation at that moment to be there for that family, for the relatives, for the officers. And to see that scene uh, at Temple University and these brave men and women uh, in uniform uh, literally breaking down in tears, um, and you're standing in the middle of it, uh, and people looking for uh, leadership, looking for direction. Um, I had never experienced anything like that in my life, and um, it's, it's very jolting. Uh, fortunately, um, you know, Commissioner Ramsey was there, uh, Clay was there, Clay Armbruster, Chief of Staff, Everett Gillison, Deputy Mayor, uh, and, um, and other folks, and they really, you know, supported me as I try to provide support uh, to others. Um, 
2008, in that regard, I mean, it was a very rough year. We lost four police officers uh, killed in the line of duty. It may have been the most of any major city in the country. Um, it's very painful. Um, you never get over it. But in that moment, it's not about you. It's about them. And you have to be there for them. Um, but there's nothing to prepare you for that. There were many instances during the course of your mayorality where you were known for being very blunt spoken. And one of them you write about in the book in the context of flash mobs. This was a speech that you delivered at Mount Carmel Baptist Church, where you're a member. Uh, I turned to the parents. I told them bluntly, get your act together, raise your own kids, know where they are. I had a particular message for the fathers in the black community. You're not a father just because you have a kid or two or three. That doesn't make you a father. A father is a person who's around to participate in a child's life. He's a teacher, helps to guide and shape and mold that young person someone for that young person to talk to, to share with, their ups, their downs, their fears, their concerns. If you're not doing that, you're, you're what the girl call out in the street, that's my baby daddy, that's my baby daddy. Don't be that. What reaction did you get from all communities after that speech? Um, well, in the church, um, I mean, which I anticipated because, I mean, I know the, know the pastor well, I know the members. Um, I mean, that was a message. I mean, that's, a, that's, that's an old school conversation. That's a, that's a 55th and Larchwood uh, kind of discussion. That's, I mean, the, the parishioners are more in that generation and would be supportive of that kind of message. Um, but, I mean, I wasn't only talking to the congregants. Um, I think it was uh, fairly well received uh, in a variety of places, um, and um, and I'm sure there were some folks who, who who didn't like it. I mean, you can't you can't get away from that. But I mean, I just think that as mayor, especially uh, and as an African American, um, it is very very important to be truthful and honest uh, about some of the challenges and ills uh, that uh, have a particularly uh, significant impact. Uh, in the black community. Um, I would get criticized uh, for talking about uh, violence uh, in the black community. Uh, and you know, my position was, um, if I got kids dying in the street, I have to say something about it. Uh, and I'm going to challenge uh, any of you uh, on your behavior. Uh, whatever your disputes may be, uh, there's nothing that justifies you walking up and shooting somebody in the head. Nothing. If I hadn't read the book, I might have misspoken and called it a sugar tax or a soda tax. But now I know I'm supposed to say sugar sweetened beverage tax. Yes, SSB. Yes. How come? Why so important? Um, well, I mean, I, I mean, I guess there are some purists out there. I mean, that's what it is. Um, that's what it was targeted to be. The you know the colloquial, uh, the easier because you know we like to shorten things in Philadelphia. So it's sugar uh, soda tax. Um, you know, look, I, I mean, I don't have some, you know, personal uh, vendetta uh, with, the, uh, with, with, with the soda folks. I mean, it is possibly the least nutritious, possibly the most worthless product ever created. Um, <laughs> but, I mean, it's not personal. Um, it has been shown to be a component of the level of overweight and obese conditions uh, across America. We have a particular challenge here in Philadelphia uh, that our health department and others uh, worked on. Uh, and so we were pretty aggressive uh, about it for two reasons. One, it is a very serious health issue in this city. And second, uh, first, uh, the first go around, the city needed the money. And the second go around, the school district uh, needed the money. Um, but I think it's, you know, at the time at least, the lack of recognition by the industry uh, that they were at least a contributor uh, to the problem uh, that uh, you know, may have generated some extra aggressive uh, activity from me. I'm going to move on, keeping an eye on the clock, to audience questions. I have one more, though. Whether it appears in the book or not, tell me a story about the Pope. You had so many interesting experiences relative to securing that visit. Give me something. Um, well, um, first, the fences were not eight feet high. Um, <laughs> but more importantly, um, I've just never met anyone that had such a, such a, a warmth and a spirit uh, about themselves, who was so focused 
on other people, that the behind the scenes discussion, I mean, what people saw, the, of course, the, the excitement and the pageantry of, you know, three different outdoor events and the mass and the, and the um, Independence Hall or at the Constitution Center. Um, but I think, for me, one of the most moving moments was one that was maybe not as visible to a lot of folks, which was uh, the visit to our, uh, to our prison. Um, the Pope, uh, Pope Francis, personally insisted uh, that the visit to the prison had to be on his schedule. Um, and there were a lot of naysayers back and forth, uh, even some of his own folks expressing concern. And he just said, I mean, I guess you can say this when you're the Pope, like, that's what I'm going to do. So, end of conversation. Um, the inmates uh, were thrilled. They made a chair for him, uh, which uh, the Pope insisted be taken back on, I don't know if it's Papal One or, you know, I'm not sure what he, I'm not sure what he flies. Um, but uh, that chair went back uh, to, uh, to, to Rome. And uh, again, he's one of these folks, you know, the folks who are trying to move him along and, and he just resists uh, any effort uh, for people to interfere with his ability to connect with someone uh, in a very personal and direct way. I mean, it just totally brushes them off. Two questions came from the audience pertaining to Amazon. One, what would be the pluses and minuses if Philadelphia were to win? Maybe I should have put the cart before the horse. What should Philadelphia be doing now to try and market itself in that regard? Well, you know, that's always, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm tremendously sensitive uh, to uh, successors uh, trying to, uh, A, publicly give advice to currents, um, and B, I mean, I, I am so far away from, um, you know, kind of the inside story on what, you know, what the city is trying to do. But in a much broader sense, I mean, obviously, um, you know, Amazon and 50,000 jobs and whatever the economic development benefits are, I don't know what they're seeking uh, for themselves. But, I mean, it would be a tremendous boost to not just Philadelphia, but certainly uh, at a minimum the tri-state area. Um, I think the issue seems to be where um, we fortunately, I think, have a number of potential uh, locations and we've kind of positioned ourselves uh, that way. Um, and so since I don't know what Amazon is actually asking for, um, I would say to any of the 20 uh, cities that are now on the, on the short list, just, you know, be mindful of, you know, if that ends up being your deal with one particular company, does that, you know, put you out of position uh, to uh, attract other businesses or possibly put, set you up uh, that everyone's going to want the same thing uh, if they, you know, come forward with, uh, with, a, with a big announcement? Great question. What has been the most challenging aspect of your transition from public to more private life? Well, first is, uh, I think, uh, just realizing uh, the, the, the true recognition that um, it's really kind of over. Um, and so, um, you know, I, I, I think some people know, you know, I bought a Tahoe before I was elected. We donated to the city. That's what I rode around in and had, you know, tremendous uh, uh, police uh, protective detail for eight years. Um, uh, didn't have a car uh, and pretty much only rode in that car unless uh, I went uh, somewhere with, uh, with Lisa. Um, the tradition is uh, after leaving office you get basically another six months to kind of transition but everybody goes away and you, and you, and you keep one officer. So um, the, uh, the agreement was uh, because we were hosting the Democratic National Convention uh, in 2016, normally it would have been at the end of June and the the agreement was it would be right after the end of the convention. So, um, you know, the Hillary Clinton gives a big speech Thursday night, and um, it's over on Friday. Um, take care. Have a nice life. Uh, we've enjoyed you. Goodbye. So, uh, so, uh, so I spent a lot of time in uh, other people's vehicles, um, you know, on on on, on apps. Um, so. But the real moment uh, that you know uh, is, is really this one. So um, I'm up at Columbia, and uh, this is like um, April of uh, 2016. 
And there was something going on back in Philadelphia. So at that time, my class was, um, uh, was two in the afternoon until about four. So I called one of those companies. And I'm trying to catch the 5 o'clock train at Penn Station from Columbia University at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> I bolt out the door. The thing says my car is there. I come right out the door. I jump in the vehicle. And we're going on. And we go down to the end of the block. And then we make a right. And you know, New York City has like these really long blocks. The, you know, I guess the avenues are, are really long, not the number streets. And so we get about a halfway, and the guy's phone rings, and he hits in, and the person says, where are you? And he says, what do you mean? And then he turns around and looks at me. I got in the wrong car. <laughs> and so he turns, so, you know, I'm in New York, and he just turns around, and he says, well, like, you have to get out. <laughs> Sorry. And I had been traveling, so I had my, you know, like everyone knows my little backpack, but I had some luggage. And so I get out. So then I call the one that's in my phone. The guy answers and he says, I said, I, you know, I got in the wrong car. Can you come get me? And he says, All right, well, where are you? And so I look up and there's, you know, I have these long blocks. There's no street sign. And I said, Well, I don't know where I am. And he says, Well, then I can't come get you. So I walk down to the end of the block, and it's 110th and Columbus Avenue. And it was in that moment that I said, I'm just another guy <laughs> standing on a street corner at 110th and Columbus, and not a soul out here gives a damn about me. It's over. Right. <laughs> You were most proud of the fact, you say in the book, of the decline in homicide rate and the increase in high school graduations. If you wish one more thing would have occurred from your mayorality, it would have been that you could have done even better in that regard. Better in both. Um, because for me, uh, both were always inextricably tied together. That if we did a better job, uh, educating our young people and young adults, if they had more opportunity, if more went on to higher, graduate from high school, went on to higher learning, uh, return to school from, you know, go to alternative schools, that um, educational attainment actually has an impact on crime. Uh, and, um, you know, I get asked that question. I'm proud of the, the, the two positives uh, and disappointed, you know, in myself uh, that uh, we were not able to accomplish even more. Um, it, it, our kids deserve a high quality education and they deserve uh, the opportunity to go on and fulfill their potential and the city is held back uh, by lack of educational attainment, the vice grip of poverty uh, that holds so many people back, uh, the number of folks who are returning citizens uh, who still find it challenging uh, to get a job, uh, and um, the, the changing nature of our economy uh, and the skills mismatch, mismatch uh, between jobs that are available and the skills that people have uh, and are still not able to, to find employment. So, you know, the thing about uh, in Philly as compared to, you know, Boston, Chicago, a few other places, it's a two-term limit. Uh, you do what you can, and time is your most precious resource, and you know, we tried to do the best we could with what we had. I had an incredible team, uh, which made all the difference in the world. Uh, and, um, you know, you pass a baton and someone else gets to run the rest of the race. A, a great, I think, law enforcement question from the audience. Why do policemen always win in arbitration after they're fired? Um, so, first, uh, um, I mean, I have to say, they don't always win, um, but I mean, there is a pretty high success rate. Um, I think the biggest part of it is the arbitrators, there's a limited pool of arbitrators. In many instances, um, they're agreed upon by both sides, 
And I think the arbitrators uh, are very cognizant, many of them, of the fact that uh, if they are not somewhat favorable uh, to uh, the aggrieved officers, they'll never get picked again. That's it. Two final questions for Mayor Nutter. Number one, did I just lose my microphone? There we you go. Got it. Comment on the challenges of keeping corruption out of government. Well, first, it's a, it is a daily, um, daily focus, daily exercise. It is, to some extent, unlike many, many other components of the government. So, you know, if you're in a street department, you know, you fill a pothole, you know, that's kind of done for now. You'll revisit that maybe 10 years down the road. Uh, we pick up folks' trash, you know, once a week. But once you've emptied the can, that's it. You give somebody a building permit, they're gone uh, until they come back to build another building. Um, people are people. And, you know, somebody right now, somewhere in the city, is probably trying to figure out, you know, how to do something that they shouldn't be doing. Uh, and so it is a constant effort, constant barrage of folks trying to do bad things and having, you know, again, during my time, uh, folks like Joe Markman and, and Amy Curlin uh, and, you know, uh, uh, integrity officers all across the government knowing that, A, they would always be backed up, B, this is how we're going to run the place, uh, and uh, we will not tolerate this kind of nonsense, um, I think sent the right message. Um, People st still did stuff. Almost all of them got caught and got in trouble, and we publicized it. I mean, it's just, it's not worth it. Um, and, and I think that did help clean the place up. But I mean, it's, it's never over on the ethics side. It's relentless, it's every day, and you've got to preach that to the troops and to the public. I mean, I would remind folks, you know, it takes two to tango. Uh, and, you know, called on the public from time to time, stop trying to corrupt our people. Um, you know, there was uh, one of our biggest ones, um, you know, a guy was selling, he was overbuying toner for the city and then selling it to a company uh, in, I believe, Arkansas. Um, he lost his job, went to jail, the husband and wife of the business, they were indicted, they went to jail, and a huge fine uh, paid back to the city. I think they ripped us off for like $600,000. For the stuff and toner. and toner. Toner's expensive. I, I don't know what it is, but <laughs> you don't yeah. need to steal ours. I know. <laughs> yeah. You're going to sign a number of books in just a couple um, of minutes. Yeah. So, so sort of take us out with a discussion of your writing process. How did you go about this? Did you enjoy it? Not enjoy it? Talk to me about that. Well, it's kind of funny when Vince said, um, you know, in his latest book, and I'm standing by. This is the only book. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, this, uh, so, uh, you know, I said in an interview the other day, I mean, of all the things that I thought I might do uh, post, uh, writing a book was not one of them. Now, it's been mentioned any number of times. Um, Lisa's talked to me about it. Uh, Desiree, our former uh, director of communications, talked to me about it. And my first response was, A, I don't know anything about writing a book. B, I don't have time to write a book. Um, and C, I don't know anything about writing a book. Um, but, uh, you know, Peter, uh, Gree, and, and, and a bunch of folks over at uh, Penn Press uh, talked to me about it. And, I mean, at least for this, they made it pretty, pretty easy. This started um, the spring of last year. Uh, and I gave a series of lectures uh, out at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, which were all videotaped and then transcribed. Hence, there's a part one, part two, part three, because I did three lectures. Um, and then they found a tremendous uh, uh, writer, uh, uh, Pamela Haig, who worked with me. So all the language is mine. It's out of my mouth. It's, you know, I mean, there's nothing kind of manufactured or, or created. But, I mean, there is a way of writing. And, you know, I don't really think anyone would want to read what I actually wrote, because I write like I talk. Um, and so, I mean, there's a craft to that. But this was not, you know, some out of the 1950s 
with me sitting at a typewriter, I mean, that book would take like 40 years, right? So, um, and, and then no one would really be interested in that. So, um, the three lectures, a couple of manuscripts, some readings, a couple of interviews uh, over, over the course of last summer, and, you know, they're literally off to the races, and now you got a book. Ladies and gentlemen, Mayor, the best job in politics, Michael Nutter. Thank you all for coming out. You know, this is kind of one of these things where, like, you don't know if anybody's going to show up. Um, it would be so embarrassing. Um, to all the folks who are in the administration, um, thank you, thank you, thank you. I think this is the first time we've really had an opportunity to have so many of you together. And my major goal out of the night was just not to cry. Um, I cannot, uh, it's just, what an experience. Um, thank you.